50 Sunday evening services at 5 p.m. and of course Wednesday evening services at 7 p.m. If you're visiting with us, we'd like to welcome you uh, with us tonight. There is a visitor QR code, uh, which will take you to our visitor connect card, if you don't mind to fill that out so that we can get to know you a little better. For anyone that might need the nursery, it is located through the doors uh, by the sound booth in the back. You'll be free to use that at any time. There is a prayer list in the bulletin. If you know of someone that needs to be on the prayer list, um, you can put the person's name on the list in the foyer, or you can tell one of the elders or Jane. There is a new prayer list in the back posted for April, so that has been updated. If you need an email sent out for a loved one or event, please speak to an elder. We do have several that we need to keep in our prayers tonight. Ruth Rick Whitaker, Jane Ragland's mom, is at White House Healthcare and Rehab, room 82. Carolyn Stewart is at Hendersonville Hospital. Uh, she has a blockage in her stomach. And then Tony Smith, which is Linda Merrick's sister, uh, please keep her in your prayers. Along with that, we want to keep Ross, Summer, Noah, uh, Nora, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> Rachel, and Libby in our prayers as they're all kind of fighting colds right now. And then Elizabeth Durick found out today that she does have another kidney stone, so we need to make sure that we keep her in our prayers as well. Dalton and Kelsey Knight. Um, Kaylee Lynn was born on March 26 and weighed 8 pounds and 3 ounces, so we want to congratulate them on the birth of their daughter. We are collecting funds for the Wamsley family, uh, the fire fund. So if you want to donate to that, you can give money to Kerry Poole. He takes cash and checks made out to Fountainhead uh, with fire in the memo, or you can Venmo Kerry as well and use fire as the subject line. We are having a card shower for Rayleigh and Duncan Smallwood. Um, their baby boy is due in April. Um, there is a card box located in the foyer if you would like to give to that. There are two upcoming ladies events at local congregations. For more details, there are flyers hanging in the foyer for those. In terms of our events, April um, 6th or the 18th, we've got quite a few things coming up. So on April 6th, we have Making Music at Freed Hardeman University. If you signed up for that, um, it is time for you guys to start paying your $25. So if you want to either give that to me, cash, uh, check made out to Fountainhead, or you can Venmo me as well for that. That's $25 a ticket. So if you signed up for that, you can begin to give that to me. On April 7th, we have our Youth Devo at Richland Place, which starts at 4. April 9th will be our Couples Bible Study at 6 p.m. And April 13th will be our Youth and Family Rally, um, starting at 9 and ending at 1. Uh, we will have classes for all ages. We are advertising this as a Youth and Family Rally, so don't just drop your kid off, kids off for that day. Uh, try to stay with us and be with us. Uh, Matt Miller will be our keynote speaker for that event. We'll have other congregations uh, here as well, so we want to have a good showing for that. Again, that's April 13th. April 14th, we have our ladies' fellowship meeting at 3.30, and then the 18th, we have our Forge men's meeting. We do want you to keep in mind that we do the food for kids. Uh, we're continuing to support this ministry. Many children in Portland depend on this food, so please consider giving to that outreach if you can. Again, you can give that money to Carrie Poole. There's a box in the foyer, or you can Venmo Carrie. Are there any other announcements that we looked over or failed to mention? If not, uh, Ben Triplett will be our song leader, and Tim Wright will have our prayer. To go ahead and mark the invitation song will be 578. <coughs> 578. And the song before our lesson tonight will be 677. 677, first and third verse. Unto the earth. Oh. 
Good evening. Hope everybody's doing all right tonight. Uh, what I'd like to talk to for just a few moments tonight is what I titled uh, Toning Your Toad or Your Attitude. On the wall of a little donut shop, a sign read, As you travel through life, brother, whatever be your goal, keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the hole. And I have a real uh, personal, simple way to, to make sure you keep your eye on the donut, not the hole. You just buy a donut without a hole. You know, like jelly filled, apple fritters. You, know. you don't have to worry about the hole, then you can just see the whole picture. <clears throat> have you ever acquired the bad habit of looking only at the hole? Whether you realize it or not, your attitude is a choice. You choose your attitude every day. And as and the sign points out you can choose to look at the donut as a whole or just the whole of the donut. And it's a decision that only you can make. You decide when you wake up every morning what your attitude's going to be and how you're going to let things around you affect your attitude. When you stop and think about it, life is a big, long string of choices. From the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed, we make countless decisions. We decide about what we're going to do, what we're going to eat, what we're going to say, who we're going to talk to, who, uh, where we're going to go, and how our attitude is going to be. Irving Berlin once observed that life is 10% of how you make it and 90% of how you take it. You can choose whether you let the events around you make you have a positive or negative attitude. He understood that in life, the right attitude is crucial. So if you have become caught up in the daily grind and making yourself a negative attitude, take a step back, compose your thoughts, and count your blessings. Because if we count our blessings, then we shouldn't have a negative attitude. We should have a positive attitude because we have countless blessings from God. And we have every reason to choose a positive attitude. With all the hustle and bustle of life, sometimes it's easy to choose a less than positive attitude. If we give in to the easy choice of a less than positive attitude, we can miss out on some of the great blessings of life because we choose to see the negative side instead of the positive. We choose to let, if we have a bad day, we can choose to let it affect us negatively, but that's not an excuse. We still make, out, make our own attitude. Our attitude is our choice. We can think positively positively about our life and things in it where we can go through life being negative <clears throat> being negative about life by looking at the clouds and not seeing the silver lining surrounding the clouds you know some days make it a little bit more difficult to uh, have a positive outlook but it's all what we put into it <clears throat> and we may have to put a little extra effort in but because we're human we're always thinking about something our brains are constantly going. They never shut off. At least if you're like mine, my mind's going constantly. I mean, even when I lay down at night, you know, get several things going through my mind. <clears throat> but that's all right. You know, we can use our thoughts to help make life better. You know, when we adopt a positive attitude and focus on our blessings and not our misfortunes. So when we, you know, our brain is constantly going, try to make it positive. You know, don't worry about what's going on. Don't worry about what we can't handle. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16 says, You're the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If we go around with a negative attitude, how can we be a positive light to those around us and be the salt of the earth? We can't because if we have a negative attitude, we're going to have lost our flavor. Only with a positive attitude can we be a shining light of God's word to those around us <clears throat> and be the salt that sees them. You know, I'm not saying that there's not going to be times that we're not going to be negative, have a negative thought, because we're human. We are. 
but it's a lot more fun to be around people that you're like-minded and you all have a positive attitude. And sometimes, if maybe we have a negative attitude, being around friends that have a positive attitude can bring us up. So my challenge to all of us tonight is to check our attitude and try to always have the positive attitude and not a negative attitude. Because if you really stop and think about it, God has blessed us so much that we should always have a positive attitude. Even when things may be going rough, we need to look and say, I'm lucky. God loves me and he's blessed me. So I should have a positive attitude. If there's anyone here tonight that we can help in any way, we should come as we stand and sing. Most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we're indeed grateful, Father, for this day and for all the blessings of it. We're so thankful, Father, for this midweek Bible study. We're grateful, Father, for each soul that is represented here this evening. We pray, Father, that you might be with each one of us and bless us during this hour of study. We pray, Father, that as we study from your word, this evening, Father, that we can put away the cares and concerns of the world, that we can tune our minds to those things that are spiritual, Father, that we can glean those things, Father, from your word that might build us up and make us stronger, Father, and help us to live a closer life to thee and more in accordance with your will. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the teachers of the hour and we just pray, Father, that you might be with them and bless them with a good memory of the things that they have prepared. We pray, Father, that you might be with us also as, as students of your word, Father, that we may hear us for eternity. Our Heavenly Father, at this time we're so thankful for Jesus and for what he means to us, Father, as our Savior and our Redeemer. And we're ever grateful, Father, for he is our example, Father, and he was the perfect sacrifice for our sins, Father, that he died in our stead. And we're ever grateful, Father, that he was willing to go to the cross and to fulfill the scriptures and, Father, to become sin. And we're just ever grateful, Father, for that and so thankful, Father, that he rose on the third day, giving us hope of eternal life once this 
physical life here upon this earth is over, if we're faithful and obedient to your will. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for his blood that he shed that cleanses us of our sins, Father, as we walk in the light. And this time, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will forgive us of any sin or shortcoming that we have that is outstanding in our life, Father, that we might be forgiven, Father, as we repent of these things, that we might be pure and justified in thy sight in this very hour. Our Heavenly Father, we're mindful of those who are sick the world over, those, Father, that are on our hearts and minds, and even those names, Father, that were read before us just a few moments ago. We pray, Father, that you might be with them and bless them, Father, with a reasonable portion of their health. It be your will. We pray, Father, that you continue to be with us on throughout this night and throughout this Bible study and be with us, Father, as we depart and go our separate ways. We pray, Father, that we might be salt and light among those that we come in, in contact with, Father, that we might ever have your son Jesus on our hearts and on our lips, Father, to the world, that we might proclaim him and his word to the world, and Father, giving them hope that we have in our life. Continue, Father, to be with us and bless us, and just pray, Father, that you'll keep us useful in your service, and we pray, Father, that we might serve thee all the days of our life, that when our time is up on this earth, Father, we might be numbered with the faithful, and that we can have that home in heaven with thee after a while. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Anybody else? That's my last one. What? That's the wrong lesson on the screen, guys. Michael said I had to stay on contentment tonight because he didn't have character up there, but there it was, wasn't it? I believe we got down to page 12 talking about contentment. Go back and just talk about contentment for a while. Why, why is being content important in our Christian life? What do y'all think? What do we say about that? Why would it be important to be a, as a Christian to be content? 
Peace of mind. What else? Maybe help us stay focused on God's word instead of things out in the world, things that we don't have or think we want. We see a lot of examples in the Bible of being uh, content. One of our uh, biggest examples, I would say, is the Apostle Paul and his statement that he made about being content. And we studied about that the last time uh, we were together. So starting there on, ver on page 12, the section 3, what contentment is not... We'll start there, letter A. Contentment is not indolence or lack of ambition. Usually, it is the most aggressive and active that are the most content. What do y'all think about that statement? Why would, he, why would he say that? Usually, it's the most aggressive and the most active that are the most content. Something fulfilling your life. I was back and forth on that one, too. I, I kind of thought what you said, Uncle James, that uh, if you're aggressive and you're active, you're doing and you're working and you're not sitting around thinking about what I don't have or what I wish I had or things like that. Any other comments on that one? What do you all think? It says the Apostle Paul was both. He was aggressive and active. We know he was content in his life, and he definitely stayed busy working in the Lord. Number three, he said he certainly was not lazy or slothful. God's word warns against indolence or laziness. Proverbs 12, 27 and 19 and 27. I pulled out some other verses too. Um, what the Bible says about being lazy, Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. In Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And then Proverbs 10.4 says, lazy hands make for poverty. So it's a bad idea to be lazy as a Christian, right? Because as Christians, we're supposed to be working for God. And we only have so much time, don't we? You turn around and you'll be like me, 40 years old and don't know where life went. <laughs> that was waiting on you for that one. Yes, 40. I wrote down a statement here too, um, if I can find it. It says, real contentment, according to the Bible, is not a state of account. It's a state of heart. And I did like that one. Real contentment, according to the Bible, is not a state of account. It's a state of heart. And it had a neat little saying. It said there's a Japanese proverb that says, even if you sleep in a thousand mat room, you can only sleep on one mat. <laughs> I thought that was neat. I couldn't read that in Japanese, Brother Al. That's the best I could do. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Letter B. We're still talking about what contentment is not. It is not being indifferent to conditions about me. Stoicism. I think that's how you pronounce that, teachers. If it's not, just overlook me. Um, I did look it up, and the best thing I could come up with that is that is emotionless, showing no emotion. It says not let self become involved with things or people and that you can't be disappointed in that way. So he's saying that's what contentment is not. Just because you're standing there not showing any emotions like you don't care, that's not saying that you are content or not content. But it says this is not God's way for man. The apostle was moved by what he saw, witnessed, and experienced, talking about Paul here. And he did not isolate or insulate himself from things or people. And he also submitted without complaint to the unavoidable necessities. 
Contentment is the total enjoyment of God's good things on one hand and the enduring of trials and tribulations without murmuring on the other hand. That's a tough statement there, isn't it? Because we like the good things, but the enduring of trials and tribulations, and we can do that too, but then that last statement, without murmuring or without complaining, that's where we flub up a lot, isn't it, as Christians, just as humans. We like the good times. We don't like the, the bad times. So how, how would contentment play into that statement? Sammy's got an answer. I see it on his face. <laughs> Maybe your priorities have shifted a little yeah. bit. I, I see yeah. that too. But I guess you really can't enjoy what God's done for you if you can't, you know, make it through those things with some sort of, you know, contentment or peace. God has done a lot for us. I mean, oh. just the, the fact we got air to breathe. Yes. Yes, God's just gone plumb crazy blessing us, for sure. Do you think we're more content in our young life or in our older life? Older life. Older life. Because why? Because we have more stuff or because we realize what we're supposed to be doing as Christians? Yeah. Yeah. After a while, the material possessions don't mean as much do they brother al you see you see the real reason for life what we're supposed to be doing as christians Right. I agree with that. Yes, sir. Yet yeah, in our Christian life, I mean, if we have God, we should be content with God because God is everything. God is everything to us and gives us everything. It's... Right. Right, I wrote down here somewhere, I can't see it, but I think it says uh, it's not what you have, it's who you know that makes you content. Because if we know God, we should, have, we should be content. I mean, we're surrounded by so many worldly things and the devil knows how to, how to play us. And then when we get what we want, we want something else. I mean, he throws something else in front of us and we, we just block God out of the whole picture. If we can stay focused on God and the end result... We can be content with, with God. A true Christian can, yes. You know, back uh, back several years ago, before my time, uh, <laughs> the gospel in this area spread because of one important thing. People weren't busy going somewhere and doing something like that. In fact, you found them sitting in the yard some and 
out on the porch. When people come by, they talked about the Bible. They didn't talk about the football game or anything. Right. And therefore, many people learn the gospel. You know, I think we we have lived in a society. I remember before it got real busy, and now you know we're sort of caught up in that. It's hard to get out, but you know. God told his people at one time, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. So I think we live in a world that's real difficult to kind of say, I'm going to park over here out of the sky. But I think, you know, it's, it all, of course, comes from the mind, too, with how much you want to do. It is, definitely. It, it's, a, it's in our mind. And Paul said that when he was talking about it. He said, I have... We referenced that a couple of weeks ago that uh, in those verses, I think 16 times it mentioned the mind or remembrance or that it was a mental thing for him to be content. Definitely, that's a good point. So we do, we, we get too busy. The world is just busier and busier all the time and it's different times for sure. For sure. Absolutely, yes. And he says that many times, he's given us what we need. And I wrote down another statement going with that too. It says, if I'm not satisfied with what I do have, I'll never be satisfied with what I want. If we're not satisfied with what God's already given us, then chances are the next thing we get, and the next thing, the things we want's not gonna satisfy us either. That's good points, Eric, thank you. Any other comments on that before we move into the next section? Sammy's holding back on me. Four suggestions to help us be content. Letter A, realize that contentment is the results of teaching and training. How's that? How is teaching and training gonna help us be content? Right. Number one, it says it comes to those educated in godliness. And there again, I wrote, it's not what you have, it's who you know. You know, when we're educated in godliness, we see what God gives us, what he can offer us, and how we can be content by just being a Christian. And you know, that's how Paul, Paul was content, really just being a Christian, because he didn't have anything. So we should be able to do that as well. You know, when we read in Ecclesiastes, we talk about all our physical things. And what, what does he tell us? All, all is vanity. And it said, you can read that. It, it, he's done everything. I've seen everything. I've done everything. I've had everything. And you know what my conclusion is? It's all vanity. And it says, uh, it's like grasping for the wind. And you're like, man, that's the wisest man on the earth. And that's what, that's what he's telling us. I've done all these things. I've seen all these things. And my, 
my eye has wanted them and I've had them and I'm telling you now, it's nothing. It goes away. But God never goes away, does he? We always have God. Number two, it says, Paul had learned it while in prison, facing tribulations and persecutions. He'd learned to be content. And he said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. What do you, what do you pick up in that line right there? I have learned in, who, in whatsoever state I am. I'll just give it away. I was looking for learned. That, what, is, what does that tell you when he says that? I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. It tells me he wasn't born content. Tells me he didn't just wake up one day and was content. Yes. Right. Yeah, Paul, Paul never really changed his circumstances. He adapted to the circumstances, didn't he? And he learned to be content in that. But, yeah, my point with that is that he learned it, that, uh, you know, we're not, we're not born content. Actually, we're probably born selfish, to be honest. You, you see that with little kids and toys. You know, mine, mine, mine. Daddy and mama's first and second word, and mine's probably the third word out of their mouth. So we have to learn to be content, just like Paul learned to be content. And uh, like we said, he didn't, he didn't necessarily change his circumstances. He adapted to them and learned to be content in those situations. Yes. And the rougher it gets, the closer you get. And that probably had something to do with Paul. I don't know how old he was when he was in prison. And he obviously was a godly man prior to the life prior to going into prison. But I guess it was there. Right. And, and said at that point, I've, I've learned it doesn't matter where I'm at, I'm going to be content because I know God's with me. Yep. And that was a big statement for him at that time because he didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. He could have been killed right then, he could have been let go, he didn't know. Yeah. So for him to say that was huge at that point in his life. That's something. I'm going to say something for your scattering. Okay. But I'm going to say something about Let me borrow a pen. <laughs> it's so easy to be content when things are good. It's not easy to be content when things are bad because we're focusing on us. Right. And our focus and our perspective has to shift and it has to change. And we have to put it back on God and what He wants for our lives. And if we, if we, if we change that focus and we change that perspective, if all we have is Right. Now, would it help to get out of that jam? I'm sure. But God's going to be with us every step of the way. Right. That's what we We really can't be content if we are focusing on ourselves at any time, can we? Good or bad. I think, I think that's probably a big secret of being content right there is not focusing on yourself. I got, I got it right up. It's like a steel trap right there, brother. You know, we talk about <laughs> these things in class, but how well is it? How, how are we doing when we go out to practice? And I know the other night down in Forge class, we studied about having patience, not getting upset and all this. And before it's over, half the class, 
confess that they had gotten upset in traffic recently. <laughs> right. Like, well, you know, it's a good theory. How well are we going? You know, in, in thought, it's good. So, so tonight, we, we come here and we talk about all this contentment. But does... She said, burn everything we have. I took from her voice that that's all she had in life was just what was in that house. Like, yeah. Well, that's sad. It is sad. But it, maybe I misunderstood. Right. Understood it, but sometimes that's the way we are. We're content until God takes it away. And we think, mm. Yes, a absolutely. Yes. And then do we practice what we preach? I mean, we've heard that forever. Yeah, it's tough. It's easy in here to say it, isn't it? When you get out there and, yeah, we may not even get to the car, you know, and then we're faced with something already. It's very true. Very true. The Christian life isn't easy, is it? To be a true disciple of Jesus. Uh, letter A. He'd been thrown from the mountaintop of abundance to the chasm of being abased. He had learned that his hope had to be in something more stable than the circumstances of life. Boy, there's a key right there, isn't it? What did he put his faith in? In God. Something more stable than the circumstances of life because our circumstances in life are going to change all the time. But the one thing that's not going to change is God. I think Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus Christ is the same uh, today Yesterday and forever, he's not going to change on us. Things in our life are going to change for sure, but God will not. And then C, it says he put his faith in someone who could not be moved in God. And you know the phrase, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that comes to my mind. Um, we just need to learn to be content. It's easy to say. <laughs> I wish we could just check that box and be content, but it's a it's a lifelong a lifelong work. Page thirteen, letter D. He knew what it was like to be worshipped one minute and the next to be stoned by the same people. Do we get that in our lives today when we try to live the Christian life? Kind of what you were saying. When we're in here, it's one way, and when we're out there in the world. It's a whole different way if you want to look at it like that. People will turn on you for sure really quick. Number four, some of the better known persons in our world have triumphed in life, not because of circumstances, but in spite of them. Letter B, don't overrate material possessions. Why not? I like material possessions. Why not? Can't take them with you, brother Al. Yep. That's the American dream, brother Al. It's the American dream. Yes. 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 It's marketing, isn't it? They get us every time. We get what we want, and then they show us something else. It can be gone in a flash, though. could be gone in a flash, just like you saying that lady's home burned up, and Ross knows the people at their, their house. I mean, imagine if, you're, if you went home tonight and your home was gone, all your stuff in your home was gone. You know, how would we react to that? Because really, that's, that's not what we're all about as Christians. That's a lot of stuff, <laughs> but it's not what we're about. It's just our stuff. I hope nobody's house is burnt down. <laughs> when you go home, that would be horrible. So I shouldn't even have said that. We'll call you up. Yeah, you come stay with me. Yeah. Luke's room's empty. We'll you can have you. it. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> oh, me. That's how you get a house built pretty quick. Go live with your builder. Well, that's a good point, yeah. Y'all, come on. Come on. I did that once in about six weeks, man. Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. Don't overrate material possessions. 
Material abundance is not the abundant life. For one's life, let's see, he had the wrong verse on that. Luke 12, but it's verse 15. Uh, For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And then it goes on, uh, Beverly Hills, California has more combined wealth per capita than anywhere in the world. Are they content? 193 psychiatrists live there, one for every 170 people. You know, when are we going to get the memo that the people living out there, the people in Hollywood, the movie stars we look up to, they don't have anything to tell us? Why, why do we follow them? They don't have a reality. They don't. And everyone you see, not everyone, but, man, how, how many of them are, are drunks or on drugs or can't stay married more than a day and they're just not happy, but, you know, we admire them, we follow them, we think they're the best thing ever. And I, I don't understand that. Looks looks like their lives are are pretty empty to me. We should look to God most definitely. There again, that's the world, Brother Al, putting those people in front of us, you know, making us think that, hey, I want to be like that person. Ooh, politicians. Yeah, we won't do that. <laughs> yeah. I know. Moving on. <laughs> we can't solve that tonight. <laughs> we can learn to be content, though. Uh, let her see. We've got to get through this lesson. Michael said he didn't have the other one up there. Don't fret over what you don't have. Well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Don't fret over what you don't have. Real contentment, that's why I wrote that down. Real contentment is not a state of account. It's a state of heart. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was a great, uh, great statement mm-hmm. for that. Don't worry about what you don't have. We have enough stuff to worry about that we already have. And now we're going to worry about the stuff we don't even have. We can always find something to, to worry about and not be content with it. And it said uh, Ahab fretted over a possession that he wanted. You know, we've read that story about him wanting that vineyard. And uh, he pouted and he refused to eat. He wanted something he didn't have. But he was wealthy, and all he could think about was that one thing that he didn't have. And that's sad, isn't it? You know he was wealthy as a king. I mean, we're wealthy today. I was going to look up and see the, you know, how we rank among everyone else in the world as far as our wealth and I'm sure it's ridiculous what we have over other people you know we've talked about that um, yeah Brian go ahead you got to speak up brother right that's a good point that's a good point you made me lose my place as it was a good point i think too you know you think back i think back about my childhood Uh, you talk about being content We we didn't have a lot of stuff but we had everything we wanted we thought we had it all but you know these people are growing up today that have everything when they're a young kid what do they have they're always wanting the next thing for sure. They've got to have so many things to be content. And they just, we keep pushing it towards material stuff. We're not teaching our children to be content as Christians. Not teaching our children to be Christians, really, in the, as far as the world's concerned. But, but, you know, a lot of people, this is all they know. If you, if you don't come to church, if you don't know anything about the Bible, and all you grow up on is your phone and on TV, what kind of life is that? That would be terrible. I thank my mama every day for bringing me to church and raising me as a Christian. Because you know there's a better side to life. You know God's got you. 
and that you're not just out fighting in the world to get stuff. We have a home in heaven waiting for us if we live the Christian life. And that's, that should be all we need to know. We should be content in that. To know that if I live a Christian life, that one day I'll have a home in heaven with, with God. I don't know what else you could ask for. You got me on my soapbox. Preach on. Preach on. Number two. I think that's where we're at. Many are content until they see something new that a friend has. How many times has that happened? You go to the store, you see something, you talk yourself out of it. Nah, I don't want that. And the next day at work, you see your buddy with it. And you're like, man, I got to go back and get that. It's just what you see in front of you. If you see somebody else with it and you don't have it, we want it. We want it. Back to that American dream, Brother Al. A child is satisfied with a two-speed bike until a friend gets a 10-speed bike. Exactly. And adults are the same way. I think uh, I looked at this verse a little bit different. The, one of the writers was talking about it, uh, what David meant when he wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I never really looked at that as a verse of uh, showing contentment. But really it's saying that the only person, only the person who can say the Lord is my shepherd can say that they are content. If you look at it that way, if you're putting God first in your life, the Lord is your shepherd. And then you can say, I shall not want. And he said, if you're, if you're saying right now you're always wanting, it's always wanting to be the next thing, the bigger thing, the latest thing. He said, is the Lord really your shepherd? Are you really putting your trust in God? And I thought that was a neat, maybe not a spin on that verse, but a different way to look at it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Letter D. Don't overlook what you do have. I think you touched on that, Brother Al. That, that's a lot of our problem, isn't it? I mean, we have so many things. We don't even remember what we got. We got so many things. Yes. Yes. Go to a third world country, Brother Al said. Talk to some of these missionaries that, uh, that we get to talk to, and they can tell you their experiences over there and what people don't have. I mean, just the basics of life, running water, food, shelter, clothing. Yeah. I think... I think that's one reason they're so receptive. They're more receptive to the gospel than we are because they need, they need that. They're looking for that. They're searching for something better. And we got it too good. We don't need anything else, do we? We don't think we do. I think that's a lot of it. I think that's why they're more receptive than we are. Don't overlook what you do have. Contrast what you are with what you might have been without Christ. That's a tough one there, isn't it? That makes you think right there. Contrast what you are with what you might have been without Christ. Where would we be if we weren't raised in the church? Where would we be if we didn't know about God and the gospel? Hmm? We wouldn't be here tonight for sure. We'd probably be out chasing the dollar. Mm -hmm. I appreciate him for that. Yes. Yes. Sometimes it's easier learning the gospel later in life, isn't it, than growing up in the church because you take it for granted, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We take it for granted. I, I think if if I didn't know the gospel and you brought it to me today and I accepted it, I would be, I hate to say it, but I think I'd be more on fire for the gospel now than I would known it my whole life. It's a good point. 
Stop looking at things you don't have, but look at what you do have. There again, it, it's, it's a really simple concept, I think. Uh, a, a regular job, good food to eat, health, clothing, shelter, etc. Majority of earth citizens have far less, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, how, how blessed we are just to live in the United States in Portland, Tennessee, the things that we have and, and we take for granted. And then I wrote, I think I've already said it, but I wrote contentment is knowing if I'm not satisfied with what I do have, I'll never be satisfied with what I want. I, we have so many things. If we're not satisfied now, chances are we're never going to be satisfied with, with any type of material possessions. In our conclusion, number one, admonition of Scripture, Luke 3, 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. What's that verse there talking about? He's telling them to be content with their wages, implying that they shouldn't use maybe their authority to seek uh, more personal gain than you know what was what would have been fair to them. To be content with what with your wages. Are we content with our wages today? No, we always want more, don't we? Yeah. No matter what you make, it's it's funny. And I guess that's showing my age too, but I can think what I made when we got married. And then you think what Luke makes today, and then you think what the next guy makes. You're like, man, that's just getting crazy, isn't it? You're, and we're just never happy. We're never content. Whatever you make, you're always wanting more. I can go get a better job, make more money, more money, more money. When we should be, if we were content. Think of, think of how much more work we could do for God if we were content. We wouldn't be focusing on, on all this stuff and all the time. Think of all the time we spend at our job. And I know we've got to work. I know we've got to make livings, but look at your priorities. Is working that job and making that money to buy all this stuff your priority? Or is serving God your priority? If we were more content, if I was more content, I, I would spend more time working for the Lord instead of for stuff. 1 Timothy 6, 8, and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Are y'all going to be content with that? That was Paul speaking there. He said, with food and raiment, let us be content. I don't know. But he knew, didn't he? He had experience in that, and he was content with food and clothing. Hebrews 13, 5, and be content with such things as you have. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So fix our eyes on Jesus. And in 1 Timothy 6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Those who live in a way which honors God and are satisfied with whatever they have, they possess a strong spiritual life. I think we think of these things always in the terms of physical things and material things. But it's not just that. The reason Paul could be content in whatever is because he knew the end was a huge victory and yes. great, great gain. So yes. If we only look at what we got in the bank, you know, I guess we would continually want to build that up. We don't know what's going to happen, but we got to build it up. Right. But if we look at it as we have gained so much from, didn't it say it above, by being living the life of, with Christ, contentment can come from that. Definitely. Not laziness, but contentment. Right. Right. Excellent point. We are out of time. That worked out good. I'll pass out the next lesson. I think the next lesson is on character. We'll pass it out next week. Uh, if y'all would like, we'll close in a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight and we praise and we lift up your high and holy name. 
Father, what a blessing it is to be here to study your word. What a blessing it is to meet with the saints. Father, help us to be content in our lives. Help us to look at our priorities and be sure that you are number one in our life and that we always look to increase our faith and increase our knowledge and our wisdom in you and your word. Father, give us opportunities to teach your word to others. Open doors for us where we can spread the kingdom. We pray that we always go where you'd have us to go. And we make this prayer through the precious name of Jesus. Amen.